You are listening to The Evidence Locker. Our cases have been researched using open source and archive materials. It deals with true crimes and real people. Each episode is produced with the utmost respect to the victims, their families, and loved ones. Warning. This episode deals with the abuse and death of a child. It may not be suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. As 11-year-old Nikki Verstappen was packing his bag for summer camp, he was still not sure that he really wanted to go. The previous year he didn't go, as he was afraid he would be homesick. He loved spending his summers at home in the town of Heibloom in the south of the Netherlands. Nikki could cycle over to visit friends or play at home with his sister Femke. And he loved his dog. He would miss him so much if he were to go away. The year before, his parents supported his decision to stay at home for the summer. But in the summer of 1998, he felt that he had to go. He wasn't 10 anymore. He was growing up. He had told his mother that he was a little unsure about the whole thing. But she said that once he was there, it would be fun. Besides, his best friend was going, so everything would be okay no matter what. Nikki packed his red and white pajamas, official merchandise for AFC Ajax, his favorite soccer team from Amsterdam. It was a Christmas present and he loved it. In fact, he loved anything with the Ajax logo and colors. The sons of the gods would do it again. They always came through. Nikki took his backpack and looked around the room one last time. Everything was just the way he loved it. Ajax red and white. A flag, a duvet cover, a bedside lamp, a poster of Yari Litmanen. Then he turned and left. He'd never see his room again. Nikki Verstappen was born on the 13th of March, 1987, in Heibloom, in the district of Limburg, the Netherlands. He was the eldest of two children in a tight-knit family. His dad was Peter, his mom Bertie, and his little sister, Femke. The two siblings loved to play together, and the family had a good and harmonious life. Nikki was always laid back and friendly. There are countless photos of him hugging his dog. He cycled all over his hometown of Heibloom, a small community with about 800 residents. People knew him to be a happy and well-adjusted young man. His mom called him spontaneous and sporty. Most of all, when people think of Nicky, it is hard not to mention the Amsterdam soccer team, Ajax. He was a die-hard fan who would not miss a single match. Nicky also played soccer himself. On the 8th of August, 1998, Nicky and 36 of his classmates took the bus from Heibloom to the town of Brunsum, about a 45-minute journey, heading for the De camping grounds. It was time for the annual summer camp for 8- to 12-year-olds. All kids from Heibloom had the opportunity to attend this summer camp each year. Nicky did not go the preceding year, as he was afraid that he would get homesick. In 1998, he was a bit unsure again as he loved spending summer holidays at home with his family. Just before the bus was about to leave, his best friend pulled out and opted to stay in Heibloom. Nikki decided to stick it out and stayed on the bus as he waved his friend goodbye. Once the group arrived at Dehekop, the kids were split into their tent groups. Altogether, the 37 kids were divided into 10 tents, while the 12 camp leaders split into the four remaining tents. As was camp tradition, each group had to name their new abode. The name would also be the name of their team. Nikki's tent for the holidays was christened as Night Riders. He shared it with four other boys, all friends of his, around the same age as him. 
The first day was a lot of fun with team building activities and games. That night, all the campers huddled around a campfire while one of the leaders entertained them with scary ghost stories. Wide eyed and thrilled, the youngsters were sent to bed around 10 p.m. The camp leaders went to the biggest tent they had and ate and drank till way past midnight. As they went to bed, everyone was happy. Summer camp was off to a great start, and there were a lot of activities planned for the very next day. On Monday morning, August 10th, 1998, one of the night riders woke up at 5 a.m. He needed the toilet, so he got up and left the tent to go to the ablution facilities. At that time, all of the night riders, including Nikki, were still in their sleeping bags. When another kid from their tent woke up at 6 a.m., he saw that Nikki was gone. They thought that maybe he had gone to the restroom. At 8 a.m., when the trumpet played the song that signals it was breakfast time, Nikki's concerned tent buddies told the camp leaders that they had not seen him since 6 a.m. The leaders and campers started to look for Nikki all over the campsite, but they could not find him. They called out, but there was no answer. The leaders were convinced that Nikki had run away. They called his parents back in Haybloom to tell them that he had left the campsite and that they had not been able to locate him. His mother, Bertie Verstappen, immediately knew something was wrong. He would never do something like that. He was quite nervous about going away from home with the group in the first place, so it did not make any sense that he would go off on his own. Both Bertie and Peter left Haybloom immediately and made their way to the campsite to see what was going on. The first thing Bertie noticed was that Nikki's shoes were still in the tent. If he was planning to walk away, surely he would have put on his shoes first. Together with some of the camp leaders, they searched the immediate area, frantically calling Nikki's name, but there was no answer. Around midday, they decided it was time to call the police. By late afternoon, the search party had grown significantly. Volunteers, mostly friends and family, came from Haplum, as well as the local town of Brunsum. The Verstappen family made turns to wait at the tent and to go out and look for Nikki in the surrounding bushes and fields. They were desperately looking for him, but they knew that the outcome would be bad. He would not have walked off by himself. Police questioned all the camp leaders extensively and went to homes near the campsite to inquire if residents had perhaps seen an 11-year-old runaway. Despite Nikki's family's insistence that something was seriously wrong, there was no real sense of panic. The general feeling was that Nikki had left of his own accord and got lost in the woods. They were expecting to find him alive and well. It was 95 degrees, that's 35 degrees Celsius, one of the hottest days of the whole summer. Combing the area was an exhausting job in the heat and camp leaders took turns to look for Nikki, while others kept the camp going. The kids were kept occupied in the swimming pool, while adults sweated it out in the fields and in the streets, looking for their lost friend. By nightfall, Armed forces were called in to assist with the search. The campers were sent to their tents, like everything was normal. As they fell asleep, they heard the military vehicles and searchers calling out Nikki's name into the darkness of the night. It was everything but normal. On Tuesday morning, there was still no sign of Nikki, and camp leaders decided to cancel the camp. All the kids were loaded onto a bus and taken home to Haybloom. Meanwhile, the search effort intensified as it became evident that Nikki wasn't a runaway. Police dogs were brought in and a plane did an aerial search of the area. The whole day resulted in no sign of Nikki, and with sunset around 9.15, they were running out of daylight. Then just before 9 p.m. on Tuesday, the 11th of August, Nikki's uncle, who was one of the searchers, saw something laying beneath a small pine tree. It was the lifeless body of 11-year-old Nikki for stopping. The spot was less than a mile, about 1,200 meters away in a pine grove in the vicinity of a nearby Landgraf. His little body was naked from the waist up. He was wearing his red Ajax pajama pants and blue underpants. The pajama pants, a Christmas present from the year before, were inside out and front to back. There was a wound to his head, 
but on first impressions, it did not look like it was severe enough to have caused his demise. Despite being in a pine grove, next to farmland and bush, Nikki's feet were clean. He definitely did not walk to the spot where he was found. The theory was that he was killed somewhere else, but his body was carried out to the spot and left for dead. The scene was near a parking lot that was known as a place where men would meet other men for clandestine sex. Other than that, there was not too much movement in the area. Around midnight, on the evening he was found, Nikki's body was taken to the morgue in Maastricht, the nearest city which was about 30 minutes away. The community of Heibloom all pulled together to help the family in arranging a memorial service for Nikki. The service was held on Saturday, August 15th, a week after he left home for summer camp. 600 people attended the service, which was held at the Heibloom sports fields. Nikki's coffin was covered with the red Ajax flag, something that he would have loved. Nikki's family was in a state of shock and overcome with grief. His parents were wrought with guilt. Nikki wasn't convinced that he should have gone on the trip, but they encouraged him. What could possibly go wrong? The Verstappens wanted answers. Someone had to pay for taking away their son and brother. But the police had no leads. They re-interviewed all of the camp leaders, as it was unlikely that Nikki would have left the campsite with a stranger. The post-mortem examination took place three days after Nikki's death, as the local pathologist was out of town at the time of the murder. Remember, his death had occurred in the middle of the summer holiday period. The family had to wait for two months before the results of the autopsy was released. The report said that Nikki was drugged. His body showed signs of sexual abuse. The pathologist was unable to determine a cause of death. A second autopsy was conducted with the same conclusion. There was a possibility that Nikki was sexually assaulted and they could not determine how he had died. The best guess as to the cause of death was suffocation, but there was not enough evidence to prove it conclusively. Despite the extensive investigation that followed, the case of Nikki's murder would remain unsolved for 20 years. There were many unknowns in this case. One of the biggest questions was, how did Nikki disappear from the tent? He was 11 years old. If someone grabbed him against his will, he would have screamed or put up a fight. If he was drugged and taken, the other boys in the tent would surely have noticed someone enter their tent. Perhaps Nikki had gone to the block of toilets and was taken from there. But without any eyewitnesses or physical evidence, that would be impossible to prove. Investigators turned to the evidence they did have. At the scene where Nikki was found, there were some clues. A tissue containing semen, a cigarette butt, and a beer bottle top. And forensic technicians were able to compile a DNA profile of a person other than Nikki. It was found about 100 yards from Nikki's body, closer to the parking lot. So it was not certain that the tissue was at all related to Nikki's murder. Remember, people met in this parking lot and often had sex in the woods. A year before Nikki's murder, in 1997, a DNA database was started at the National Forensics Institute of the Netherlands. At this time, DNA testing was new forensic technology, and tests were somewhat limited. Also, DNA testing against this base could only be overseen by the prosecutor and not the police. Police did not have their own database at that point in time and they did not have direct access to the NIF's database without the approval of the prosecutor. The workaround was laden with red tape, and waiting periods were very long. In Nikki's case, DNA samples of 40 men were taken. The men were camp leaders, men from a campsite nearby, and other visitors in the area. But none matched the profile found in the tissue at the crime scene. It was a shot in the dark anyway as the discarded tissue with semen was probably a leftover of a sexual encounter that had nothing to do with Nikki's death. But still, they couldn't disregard the evidence. There was some hope when a single hair, similar in color to Nikki's, was found in the trunk of a car belonging to one of the camp leaders. The sample was sent to the UK for testing, but it was found that it did not belong to Nikki. It was a disappointment, but investigators felt that they were getting closer to naming a suspect. The first person of interest 
was the 80-year-old founder of the camp, Ewa Spartan. He was the formal principal of the primary school in Haybloom, but had lost his job after he was convicted of child sexual abuse in the 1950s. He also admitted that he was near Nikki's tent at 6 a.m. on the morning of his disappearance. But he was not there for Nikki. He went to check on one of the other boys who had burnt his hand the night before. Ewa's claimed that he woke up at 5 a.m., then cleaned his tent as Camp Rose stipulated. After checking on the boy, he drove back to Haybloom to attend the funeral of a friend. He claimed that he heard about Nikki's disappearance at the funeral and went straight back to the camp. Ewis also acted strangely on the morning of the search. He kept steering the search in the direction of the scene where Nikki's body was eventually found. He was the one who informed searchers that the parking lot near the scene was a place where men would meet for sex. And in the aftermath, when it came up that Nikki was probably sexually assaulted, U.S. Barton made a very unsettling statement. He said, Is it even possible to abuse the corpse of a child? There were many things that made police uncomfortable about U.S. Barton, and they started to explore his background. Up to Nikki's murder in 1998, he was a respected member of the Hablum community. After his incarceration, he founded Camp de Heiko in Brunson, and he also started the local soccer club back in Hablum. It is astonishing that he only served three months for his crime in the 1950s and that he was allowed to work with children again. Ewis was often seen in the changing rooms at the soccer club, and he moved into an attic of a building that was part of the primary school. Many years later, it was discovered that he had photos of children, some taken at camp when boys were not wearing their shirts, or only their underpants. There was no proof that he did anything in that time. No more victims came forward but he was certainly entrenched in the youth of Hablum. In 1986, he was awarded the Royal Ribbon Award by the mayor for his contribution to the community. He was even the self-elected Sinterklaas, or Santa, of the town. After Nikki's death, a 15-year-old girl came forward and said that she attended summer camp earlier that year, and she had reason to believe that U.S. Barton sexually abused her while she was sleeping. She was unwell one evening, and he had given her medication that turned out to be sleeping tablets for adults. When she woke up, her clothing was disheveled and different to the way it was when she went to bed. She also experienced lower abdominal pain and discomfort. She immediately suspected the elderly, U.S. Barton, of molesting her. Because she didn't report the incident earlier, there was not much that police could do so long after the fact and there was also not enough evidence to arrest him in connection with Nikki's kidnapping and murder. A reward of 250,000 guilders was offered by the public prosecutor office in Maastricht. The Verstappen family was frustrated as there did not seem to be any sense of urgency in solving Nikki's murder. They approached well-known television crime reporter Peter R. de Vries and asked him to help them. He agreed to look into the case, and his involvement in helping the family over the years turned out to be the most important lifeline they had. Thanks to a campaign launched by Peter de Vries on behalf of the family, the reward money was doubled. Anonymous business people doubled the amount, making it 500,000 guilders. The first in-depth documentary about Nikki's case was broadcast nationally in April 1999. The documentary exposed U.S. Barton's devious past and asked the obvious question, why was this man allowed to work with children being a convicted sex offender? The program put pressure on police to investigate him further. The small town of Hablum was divided. Nikki's case tore the community apart. Some people wanted to protect the leaders of the camp, and some people supported the Verstappens in their quest to find out the truth, even if it meant asking confronting questions. On the 16th of September, 1998, six of the 12 camp leaders who were in charge at Nikki's summer camp visited the Verstappen family. It was a tense visit, but the family did appreciate the gesture. As time went by, more and more people from the town chose to avoid the Verstappens. They only retained a handful of loyal friends who supported them through the ordeal. In the year 2000, a memorial was built for Nikki at the church in Hebloom in an effort to reconcile the different camps. A young member of their community was dead, and they had to stick together. 
the moment of reconciliation only lasted for a fleeting moment. Townspeople were rock solid in their support of U.S. Barton and the other leaders and thought that the Verstappens were out on a witch hunt. The Verstappens eventually moved away from Haybloom in 2003, the same year U.S. Barton passed away. For Bertie and Peter, it was extremely difficult to pack up Nikki's room. They had to face the decision about what to do with all his things. His clothes, his shoes, all his Ajax memorabilia. It was almost like they were saying goodbye to him all over again. In July 1999, Nikki's case was ruled unsolved. The next month, in August, a year after the killing, Bertie and Peter Verstappen had the opportunity to meet with Queen Beatrix. They handed her a letter, an official complaint about the investigation and the death of their son. That was an effective move, as they could definitely see more efforts done by the prosecutor in Maastricht in the wake of the complaint. In 2001, Nikki's grandparents and the community of Brunsum unveiled a memorial for Nikki at the spot where his body was found. The whole event took place in silence. But no monument or gesture would ever make it okay for Nikki's parents. His mother lit a candle in their family home as soon as she woke up every morning for 20 years. She even said in an interview with Peter DeFries, I wake up at night and hear his voice. He calls me. I get up and go to look for Nikki, but he is no longer there. Their happy family of four had become an incomplete, broken family of three. With the investigation into Nikki's death closed, there was the possibility that they would never have the answers. Bertie vowed on national television that she would never let it go. As long as she was still walking the earth, she would fight to bring Nikki's killer to justice. In February 2001, more than two years after Nikki's murder, Bertie and Peter appealed to the Minister of Justice for help by writing a public letter. They publicly stated that they were at the mercy of the police and the legal system, and there were no answers. Nothing was being done to help them. Decision makers realized they had to act. The case could not remain unsolved. There was a total breakdown in trust. The general population felt it was unacceptable that a young boy could be taken from summer camp, murdered, and authorities washed their hands. In an effort to renew the investigation, a second opinion task force was handed the case in 2001. They would start from scratch and reinvestigate everything. On the 29th of June, 2001, the new investigation was able to narrow down Nikki's time of death. It was horrific news. They estimated that his time of death was between 2 p.m. on the 10th of August or 9 a.m. on the 11th of August. That means that he was alive for at least eight hours before he was killed, possibly still for one whole day while everyone was out searching for him. New DNA technology revealed that there were tiny specks of blood on Nikki's pajama pants. They only tested one of the specks and it turned out to be Nikki's blood. The second investigation also exposed many mistakes made by the first. For starters, back in 1998, they focused solely on the scene where Nikki's body was found. It was cordoned off and processed as a crime scene, even though it was determined early on that his body was left there, he did not walk to that site. Remember, he was not wearing any shoes and his feet were clean. Next to the pine grove was a wheat field with a track that ran through it. This was a possible route of entry or exit from the place where the killer had left Nikki's body. The field was not searched, and it was harvested before investigators realized that they should have had a look for footprints or tire tracks. One tire track was found close to the pine grove, but police made an inadequate cast and it could not be used. The campsite, the last place where Nikki was seen, was never treated as a crime scene. Multiple people came and went and destroyed possible clues that could have been vital to the investigation. The toilets, washing basins, and trash bins at the campsite were never searched or tested for traces of DNA. Reports of a suspicious vehicle parked in the vicinity of the campsite was never taken down as official statements and could not be substantiated at a later stage. Another problem 
was that Nikki's murder was committed at the height of the European summer. Local police were running with a bare-bones skeleton staff, as many officers had taken annual leave over that time. Some officers were inexperienced and not equipped to deal with a case of such magnitude. The second opinion investigation had more people power and more resources, and even though they could not correct mistakes made early on in the investigation, they could certainly try and gather more evidence that would lead to the arrest of Nikki's killer. Besides the camp leader and founder U.S. Barton, there were also other suspects in the case. At the time that Nikki and his friends were camping, there was another group from the Rolduck Seminary who pitched their tents nearby. A man who had piqued police interest was Rolduck's chef. He had had indecent contact with a child before and fitted the profile of someone who would do it again. On the morning of Nikki's disappearance, he was not at the campsite. He also had no alibi for his whereabouts at the time. But before police could find enough evidence to arrest him, he died in 1999. There was also another person of interest. A man, simply referred to as Vim, was a sex offender from nearby Kerkrada. Various witnesses placed him near De Hakop and a dark-colored vehicle around August 10th. Police questioned him in 2001, 2003, 2006, and 2007, every time after a new witness came forward. But in 2007, Vim died at the age of 64. To the end, he said that he had nothing to do with Nikki's death. Someone police could not afford to overlook was German serial killer Martin Ney, who killed three boys and sexually assaulted at least 40 children between 1992 and 2001. He was known as the Masked Man, or the Black Man, because he wore black clothes and a creepy black mask. He usually found his victims at campsites or in children's homes. The Haykop campsite was located close to the Dutch-German border, and one of Ney's proven crimes was committed in the Netherlands. It was plausible to consider him as a serious suspect when he was caught. However, Martin Ney confessed to all of his crimes when he was arrested in 2001. He emphatically denied any involvement in Nicky Verstappen's murder. French national Michel Fourneret, also known as the Ogre of the Ardennes, confessed to killing 11 people in France and Belgium between 1987 and 2001. But his victims were mainly female and ranged from 13 to 30 years old. After his arrest in 2003, Dutch police interviewed Fourneret about Nikki's case, but there was nothing linking him to the crime. German sex offender and child murderer Mark Hoffman was arrested in the town of Stad, north of Bonn, in December 2004. It did not seem likely that Hoffman was the man Dutch police were looking for, but they could not take any chances. In the end, it was proven that he was not in the vicinity of Brunsum in the Netherlands at the time of Nikki's kidnapping and murder. In 2004, Peter R. de Vries learned about new testing techniques in the science of DNA. He made a public request for police to re-examine the blood specs found on Nikki Verstappen's clothing. Police said that they would follow up. A year later, an anonymous person placed letters that sounded like suicide notes on Nikki's memorial in Brunson, claiming to have been responsible for the murder. Investigators were able to trace the letters to a 36-year-old man, but it turned out to be a false confession. The man was a psychiatric patient who had severe mental health issues his therapists explained that he had written the letters as a way of getting attention. The man was placed in custody for two weeks for vandalism. In 2007, Nikki's memorial was vandalized again, and supporters of the Verstappen family replaced it. A year later, just when it seemed that all hope was lost, police announced that they had found foreign DNA on Nikki's pajama pants, as well as his underpants. It was said to either be from a hair saliva, or skin. They had tested the semen in the tissue found near Nikki's body, but it didn't match DNA found on Nikki. Previous suspects were all retested, but there were still no matches. They also tested the boys who shared Nikki's tent. They tested the forensic technicians and pathologists, and in the end, they were all excluded. 
What the discovery of the foreign DNA profile actually meant was that there was proof of a male person being in physical contact with Nikki before his death. They could only hope and pray that he would be found before he could hurt anyone else. In 2010, Nikki's sister Femka, who was in her 20s by then, made a public appeal for all male members in the community to participate and have their DNA tested, all for the matter of excluding them so the family could have answers. Police had a list of more than 100 men, all of whom were part of the search party and camp management. Only 80 of the 114 agreed to provide saliva swabs, which means 30% refused. This was quite a high percentage, and Peter DeFries took to the airwaves again to implore people to participate in the tests. He explained that samples would only be used for this investigation, so if people were concerned that past offenses like theft or robbery would come up to haunt them, it wouldn't. It would only be used for the purposes of this case, and once it is solved, their samples would be destroyed. An additional 40 men came forward. The new tests were more comprehensive. Still, there was no match to DNA found on Nikki's clothes. In a desperate attempt to find the truth, the remains of U.S. Barton were exhumed for testing. There was a brief moment of hope, as U.S. was the strongest suspect throughout the years. To many people's surprise, the DNA confirmed pedophile U.S. Barton did not match the DNA on Nikki's clothes. In September 2012, the cold case of the murder of Marianne Fotstra was solved thanks to a mass DNA sweep of 8,000 men. 16-year-old Marianne was raped and murdered near her home in 1999. At first, suspicion fell on asylum seekers living in the area, but DNA from blood and semen found at the crime scene pointed to a local farmer, Jasper Steringa. Steringa was arrested in December 2012 and confessed to the murder. Earlier that same year, Nikki Verstappen's case was handed to a cold case team. The new investigators on the case vowed to go through the expansive case file from beginning to end. They identified a group of 1,500 men, all of whom had a connection to the area surrounding the campsite when Nikki was last seen. The people on the list were either camp workers, people from the nearby town, or registered sex offenders. Again, they were out of luck. But police were far from giving up. In 2017, they appealed to the public for help yet again. They requested over 20,000 DNA samples to perform kinship analysis. This would give them information about family members of the possible killer, which would narrow down the search tremendously. In the end, 15,000 people volunteered. This was the biggest DNA dragnet operation in Dutch history. It was a long shot, also the very last resort, as there was nothing else left to do. Mass DNA sweeping is a major undertaking, and people have raised many ethical questions about it. Most people felt that if they had nothing to hide, but their DNA profile could assist in solving the murder of a child, cooperating was a no-brainer. Police notified all the men by mail that they needed fresh DNA samples. If there was no response, police would pay them a visit at home to try and convince them to help. One of the men requested to give a sample didn't show up. Police visited his home twice, but he wasn't there. According to his family, the man had gone to France in February, but he had not been in touch. In April, the man was reported missing by his family. He had been missing from his home in Simpelveld, probably fleeing before police could reach him to take his DNA. Police felt uneasy about this man and dug into his past to see who he was. Jos Breck was 35 years old at the time of Nikki's murder. He lived with his mother in Simpelveld, about 12 miles or 20 kilometers from the campsite. He was an active member of the scouts and often went on camps as a camp leader. He had also worked in childcare in Brunsum for some years. 1985, he was involved in a case of the sexual abuse of two 10-year-old boys. He confessed to the crime, but was not convicted. He only received a two-year probation. This mere slap on the wrist meant that his name never made it onto the sex offender's list. 
So when police did the DNA sweep of all sex offenders in the area, he went undetected. His name never came up. Jos Breck was in the direct area of Nikki's disappearance on the 10th of August, 1998. Police stopped him as he was cycling on a road near the crime scene around midnight on Tuesday, August 11th. This was only hours after Nikki's body was found. In fact, it was around the same time Nikki's body was taken from the scene to Maastricht for the autopsy. When police asked Jos Breck what he was doing out cycling at that hour, he said that he was delivering letters to scout members, and it was too hot in the daytime hours to have done so. As it had been a very hot day, officers found his explanation plausible. When he was questioned at a later stage, he gave a different reason. In August 1998, the same month as Nikki's murder, child pornography was found on his home computer. But again, he only received a warning. Back to the mass DNA sweep of 2017. One of the 15,000 samples given to police came up as a close match. It belonged to a family member of the person who had left a DNA trace on Nikki's clothing. That person happened to be related to the missing Jos Breck. Police knew they were getting closer and asked Breck's family if he had left behind a toothbrush or a hairbrush so that they could compile a DNA profile. They cooperated with police and gave them some of his personal items. After 20 painful years, all the hard work finally paid off. In the beginning of June 2018, they hit pay dirt. A 100% match. There was no doubt that Jos Breck's DNA was on Nikki Verstappen's clothing when his body was discovered. But they asked the investigators to keep the new information quiet, as they did not want to tip the offender off. The low-profile missing persons case from the town of Simpelfeld had turned into a large-scale international manhunt. Jos Breck's last known whereabouts were in the Vosges mountain region in the north of France where he lived off the land and worked as a survival expert who led nature expeditions into the mountains. He had years of experience in the scouts, so he knew what he was doing. Breck did not use his credit cards, and he did not use his cell phone. So when he left the Vosges, nobody knew where he had gone. Police determined that he had prepared to disappear and live off-grid as he had upskilled himself in survival strategies and techniques. His computer search history showed that he was well prepared and he had researched small towns all over Europe, places where Dutch news would not make the airwaves. Law enforcement decided that the only way to smoke him out of his hiding place was to appeal for help from the public. They held a press conference on August 22nd and announced that DNA samples from belongings and DNA supplied by the man's relatives matched DNA found on Nikki's clothing. He also revealed his name. He was 55-year-old Jos Breck. In the Netherlands, it is customary to only use the initial of a surname due to privacy laws, as a person is presumed innocent until proven guilty. However, this case was an exception, as law enforcement needed help to track him down. And they did. One week after the press conference, a Dutch man living in northern Spain recognized Jos Breck's photo in the newspaper and reported his location to police. He was living in a tent next to a commune house in the village of Casteltersol, north of Barcelona. On the 26th of August 2018, 20 years after Nikki Verstappen's murder, Jos Breck was arrested. His identity was confirmed by his passport that was on his person at the time of his arrest. He was extradited to the Netherlands on the 6th of September and made his first court appearance in December. After the arrest, Peter de Vries celebrated with Nikki Verstappen's family. There was a great sense of accomplishment and relief. The journalist pointed out a shocking fact, though. Jos Breck was questioned in 2001 about his presence near the crime scene on the night that Nikki's body was discovered. That is less than two years into the investigation. The case file notes that Breck blandly stated, Yes, I can imagine why you'd want to speak to me because I have had some brushes with the law in the past in connection with child abuse. Why was this not followed up on or a DNA sample taken? He was not on the sex offenders list, but he had effectively placed himself on it. Police should have flagged him back then already. 
The trial commenced in Maastricht in December 2018. Josbrek was charged with manslaughter and not murder. Manslaughter is a lesser charge because there is not enough evidence to show that the murder was premeditated as it would be in a murder case. Bertie, Peter, and Femke were in court. They wanted to look the beast who had taken Nikki from them in the eyes. Bertie shouted at Breck, Look at me. Look at me. He turned his head away from her and looked down at his feet. Prosecution presented their most damning evidence. Hair belonging to Jos Breck was found on Nikki's pants. They did not know each other, and there was no reason for the presence of Breck's DNA other than him being the man who killed Nikki. The defense argued that Breck's hair could have been in the woods, on the ground, or on the trees, as that was a location where he trained and practiced his survival skills. Defense attorney Gerald Rutoff stated that there was a fight in the tent of Knight Riders on the night of August the 9th. The fight became physical, and a couple of slaps and punches were thrown. Nikki said that he was going to run off, which is what he must have done. Then a shocking statement. Children walk away, just like Nikki's sister who once ran away from the primary school she hated. Another fact of life. Sometimes children just die. This caused an audible reaction from Nikki's parents and their supporters in court. To insinuate that Nikki simply walked off and died was complete nonsense. Jos Breck refused to make a statement to explain how his DNA came to be on Nikki's clothing. In court, he said that he did not murder Nikki. He said, I am very well aware that this must be extremely difficult for the family, his loss and death. That must be painful and cause a lot of grief. That must be difficult. But I also find it difficult to hear the facts of what I'm accused of and to see that I'm in prison because of it. I've said before, I'm not the person who kidnapped Nikki, murdered him, or abused him. However, I am guilty of sourcing and watching child pornography on my computer. Jos Breck was not granted parole and was ordered to stay in remand. He was in court again as recent as the 9th of March this year. He still maintained his innocence, but Dutch authorities were not going to take any chances. Breck will remain in custody until his hearing in the fall later this year. The evidence locker will follow this case and keep you updated as it progresses. We can only hope that the Verstappen family will find justice for Nikki after 20 painful years. Nikki's family may have some answers though, but will they ever have closure? As Nikki's friends grow older and live their lives, their son will be forever 11 years old. Hundreds of unanswered questions haunt them daily. Would he have grown up to live his dream of becoming a professional soccer player? They have been scarred and have lost faith in humanity. How could they trust anyone after what happened to their beautiful boy? Femke Verstappen, who is a grown woman with a child of her own now, carries on her mother's tradition of lighting a candle for Nikki every day and always having fresh flowers in her home. Nikki's father, Peter Verstappen, said that Peter R. de Vries was the most important person in bringing a solution to Nikki's case, as he never forgot about it and he would never let anyone forget. He put pressure on law enforcement and used any opportunity he could to keep the story in the news. After Nikki's death, his idol, Yari Litmanen, sent a signed soccer jersey to his family. It was displayed in Nikki's room for a while, along with all of his Ajax things. After some time, the family decided to give the jersey to Peter de Vries as a gesture to thank him for all of his support. Peter kept the framed jersey in his office to remind him of Nikki for all of those years. And even when this trial is over, he will keep it there to remind himself of the bright and happy kid he only got to know when it was already too late. If you'd like to read more about this case, have a look at the resources used for this episode in the show notes. Also, visit and like our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash evidence locker podcast to see more about today's case. If you like our podcast, please subscribe in Apple Podcast or Stitcher or wherever you get your podcasts. 
We would also appreciate it if you could review the episodes, as it gives us some street cred in the world of podcasting. This was The Evidence Locker. Thank you for listening. <laughs>